All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for another uh, one of our monthly sales meetings kind of thing. And so we're going to be going over, I'm going to kind of start us off and kind of going over where we're at in the marketplace and what's going on there. But, but before we get into that, I'd like to have a little bit of a conversation <laughs> um, from the point of view of, of a salty old dog, right? Because you know, right now we're in a market that is fluctuating. We're in a market that is changing. That doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, and and that, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to put any kind of correlation to the market that we're in now is not like the market that we had in 2008. But, you know, uh, those of us that went through the market in 2008, there was a lot of folks that the market ate them. And at the same time as the market ate them, like in, in my personal experience, you know, um, it, it, was, it was vastly different for, for like Ming and I, those were some of our best years ever. Like, like, like the brokerage, where we are today, where our business is, uh, really flourished as part of the um, overall, uh, what happened in 2008, is I guess what I'm trying to say. And so, you know, if, if you choose that, that, you know, this market is, is bad for my business, then I promise you this market will be bad for your business. If you take it that, you know what, we are still selling a ton of houses. We, have, we still have a lot of listings. The market is still really good. We have a lot of positive things happening in our marketplace. And so we need to be looking at that. And, and also, you know, like, like it's up to you. You guys are, are your own small business people. You, you are not like, like, like yes, uh, you, you bless us by, by affiliating with us and hanging your license with us. But at the end of the day, you guys, like you are your own small business. You, you get to choose how you, how you operate your own small business. And so um, all that goes into, it, it, you know, mindset over market is so vastly important to you. Um, you know, so we have to make sure that, that, that we are checking our own mindset and how much of the news that we watch and, and what of different people tell us uh, that's going on out there. And so kind of before I get into anything, it's going to be like, like for those of us that have been in the market for a long time and, 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 and persevered and thrived during markets, more millionaires are made during a down market than an up. And we're not even at a down market is what I'm saying. What we are is we're in a market that is shifting, that is changing, that's moving towards a place of more balance. Uh, you know, like, like Rotunda, you know, she's been in the, in the mortgage industry since uh, for like 20 years or something like that. And I can tell you that, that lenders that were here in 2008, like, 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 like in 2008, our market got turned upside down. Property values were dropping left and right. The entire mortgage industry got turned on its ear. Um, you know, um, and on top of that, we had interest rates shooting up. So like, like when you put all that on the market at, at the same time, 2008 was a really, really difficult market. But so many of us, flourish during that time. You can either choose that this is the market that I'm going to do really well in, or this is the market that's going to crush me. So we got to look at things uh, as far as what's going on with the market. But before we look at the market, we also have to understand that part of what we're looking at is cyclical. We have annual trends every year. And so what's going over, what's going to happen on all of our numbers for the next three months? They're all going to go down. I don't care, like, like, like last year, this time, when we were in the middle of a raging market, what happened this time of year? All the numbers go down, right? I mean, fall into winter, that is the time when, especially here in Georgia, like, like things kind of kind of ramp down and then, and then we start, you know, our pending start ramping up again in January. So understand that, that some of these, like, like, like when you watch the news, when you see a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, information that people are sharing and that kind of thing around, what you're going to see is that, uh, you know, they'll be like, sales are down 14%. Okay, well, they're down 14% last year and that kind of stuff. So, so don't just take everything, you know, like, like be willing to dig in and look at what is really going on. Um, so I want to start kind of running us through kind of some things we see going on in the market. So the first thing is, you know, interest rates this week are at 6.66. All right, what do y'all think about going into the week of, uh, I mean, it's the month of Halloween and we're at 666 on rates. I just think that that's a little bit creepy. Um, 
But, you know, right now, interest rates is what's really, really one of the big driving forces that we have that, that, that is a battle for. Um, but that being said, is a six and a half percent rate the worst thing in the entire world? Now, who, who bought their house at over 9%, like in the past, you know, and, 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 and thankful, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we've had a lot of folks like, like and, and, you know, where we're kind of heading with, with interest rates is, is back to the good old days where, uh, you know, in, in the past, kind of the buy cycle was you bought your first house or you bought your house with an FHA loan, and in a couple of years, you refied at a lower rate. I think it's really where we're heading back into is that same kind of layout and same kind of platform. So we do have to start off and, be, and acknowledge that like, like, like our interest rates really six and a half percent, they are. And, and are they probably gonna tick up into seven? I think that they could push up into seven, into the low sevens. Uh, I do think that we'll start tapering off. But why, you know, we have to look at why that's happening. I mean, why are interest rates moving up? Because is it because the Fed moves the federal funds rate? Yes and no, okay? And, and so where that comes from is the federal funds rate doesn't affect mortgages directly. But what happens is when the, federal, when the Fed raises the federal funds rate, it throws the markets into, into disarray. And when the markets go into disarray, then, then safe money is in um, treasuries, in bonds. And so when the markets go all cattywampus, people move over into treasuries. And so our... Our 30-year fixed rate mortgage is tied pretty directly to the 10-year treasury. Like if you'll look on here, you'll see that the red line, you know, the red line is our 10-year treasury, and the blue line represents mortgage rates. You see the correlation? So as so as so as the 10-year treasury goes, so goes mortgage rates. And so long as the Fed is right now, the Fed's fighting what? Oh, come on, y'all gonna wake up a little bit. It's 10 o'clock now. Inflation, we're fighting inflation, right? So as so long as they're fighting inflation, they're gonna be, they're gonna be trying, they're, they're trying to throw some cold water onto our market. And so as the market reacts to that, we're gonna keep seeing the 10-year treasury. But you can also see when the 10-year treasury needs to come back down, and it will be coming back down as soon as we get rid of some of this market volatility. So I do feel good about the long-term uh, you know, path for rates moving back down. I do see that happening, but it's gonna be tied directly to the 10 year treasury. We have to understand what that correlation there really is. And so like, like not this, this past time when, when the Fed raised the federal funds rate, mortgage rates went up. But the previous time when the Fed raised the federal funds rate, what happened to mortgage rates? They went down the month before. So, you know, it, 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 it is an indicator, but it's an indicator of what's gonna happen to market up there. Now, I think that they're going to raise it another 50 to 75 basis points one more time, and then they'll start tapering off. It's kind of what I expect to see happen. Uh, you know, and, and unless unemployment starts moving up, they're probably not going to, to soften their amounts right now. So, but the other thing is that happens is when we start putting higher interest rates out there, and then when you come, com, you know, when you compare that to the home buyer sentiments that we have going on in our marketplace, like, there is a direct correlation at the same time to that. So just like the 10-year treasury affects mortgage rates, what's mortgage rates affecting out here? Home buyer sentiment. And so, so our buyers are, are going through a bit of sticker shock right now. You know, they're, they're seeing these, these, you know, they're seeing that the prices are still remaining elevated. Uh, they're also seeing where, where the interest rates are, are, are a challenge. Now, we have a lot of folks that are living in yesterday for our buyers. Right. So when I throw out there that, you know, I bought my first house at over 9%, like, like, like they don't have that memory. Where, where do a lot of our first time buyers remember? February is what they remember. That's as far back as their memory goes. It's February. Okay. And so for those of us that have been in the market for a while, like, like that's not normal. Like, like that 3%, that ain't normal. That, that's, and, and I don't think that I was honestly shocked we ever got to threes. It was artificially low. Uh, during that time, they, they continued to try and stimulate the economy through there. And so it kept rates historically low. We're not going back to three. Now, I, I can see us moving back into the fives and that kind of stuff, but I don't see us moving back into threes. And so, you know, this past summer, we, you know, we had a lot of folks dealing with that knee-jerk reaction. So 
is this going to be our normal for the next year or so? Probably. We need to be ready for that. So like, like the, the idea of, you know what, I'm going to wait to start prospecting for buyers until rates go back down. What are you really going to say to yourself? I'm just not going to do any work is what you're going to say. And there's still a lot of folks, that, and, and we're going to look at the numbers. You can still, there's a lot of folks still buying. There's a lot of folks still listing. And we got, and we, we need to be part of that. But also understand that our home buyer sentiment, you know, th this is what our consumers, this is what our buyers, sellers, clients are really feeling right now. They're, they're worried about the market. They have concerns about that. And you can kind of see what's kind of happened with the, with the home purchase sentiment index over time right now. And so, you know, there's still a lot of folks that feel like, you know, it's still a good time to sell. Um, but we still have a lot of sellers that feel like they may have missed that market already. And we're moving into a more balanced market. There's no doubt. But is, is moving into a balanced market a good thing or a bad thing? That's good. Okay, thank you. Very good. Thanks for waking up again. But but the, uh, but I mean, but seriously, like, like, like if you were representing buyers all last summer, what, what were we crying about not having enough of? We have enough inventory, right? And all of a sudden, we're seeing an uptick in inventory, and people are going, well, I don't know. I'm like, hey, we've been begging for inventory, right? And so now, now, now we're starting to move into a more balanced market. This is a good thing. We can't maintain double digit property value increases forever because no one continues to make 20% more than they made last year. And so that's not sustainable long term. So, you know, historically, property values increase by 4.4% a year. If you, if you laid out the last 50 years of real estate, um, it, it increases by 4.4% a year. And so even with our recent spikes, guess what our 50-year average is? 4.4%, right. And so uh, I kind of see us moving towards that 4% mark over the next year. I really don't see us moving that much under it. But I see us fluctuating somewhere between 1 to 5 three to five, something in that percent range as we move forward. And I'll show you why. How much money do you need to buy the average home in the state of Georgia? 70 grand. Okay. Now, it, it, it's going to be dependent on where you are in Georgia, but just, just, that just takes the average salary versus the average uh, purchase price for this whole state of Georgia. Works out to, they, they got to make at least 70 grand. I, I give that to you just as a, like a benchmark. Like, like, hey, I'm making fifty thousand dollars a year, and I'm the only person buying. That's somebody you're gonna have a hard time when getting qualified. And how much can they really afford? I mean, I, I want to help the folks who can afford a hundred fifty thousand dollar house. I do, but how many hundred fifty thousand dollar houses do we have? <laughs> Very few, right? That kind of stuff. And and you know, never fails. Those are the same folks. Like, I want it fixed up, and if it could be on the lake, that'd be great too. Um, <laughs> No, no, it, it, it's, to, it's, to, it's total, it's total, total or, or to, total income. Now, at the same time, we have our apartments, and 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 I know that you know we're, we're in we're in real estate. Why would I bring up property? Why would I bring up apartment values? Well, what's happened to apartment rents? How much? Well, twenty one point two in 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 the last year and a half. Yeah. So, but we got to understand that, that that rental values are based on property values. When property values go up, what happens to rental amounts? Exactly. And so, if that's the case, is renting a safe haven for our folks? We have to understand that. And 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 like honestly, my heart goes out to first-time buyers. The vast majority of our first-time buyers, where are they located right now? They're they're renting, right? And so, like, like for our for our folks who have to sell and, and then buy again, did they capture a lot of equity already? Yeah, they captured a ton of equity. For our first time buyers, though, they're not getting in the game. And so, but the but the the challenge here is that we we like like where does strength in communities come from? Where does where does where does where does wealth in the United States come from? It comes out of home ownership, exactly. And so, like, like if I rent this year and next year and for the next five years, what's my average net worth? No, zero. How about if I buy this year and then in five years, what's my average net worth? Well, but, well, uh, but, uh, well, 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 but the funny thing is, is that your net worth increases when you buy a house, not just the value of the house. That, that, that's a really interesting thing that homeowners have more savings. 
homeowners have more investments. Like 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 net worth tends to increase. So you know, in those first five years, it may only be fifty fifty thousand dollars, but by ten years, it's one hundred and fifty thousand. That kind of stuff. So it's it, you know that whole snowball effect. But we got to understand that that for a lot of our folks, they're looking at these rates and they're saying, you know, maybe we'll just rent, maybe we'll just buy, and that worries me. Because we see where a lot of folks are building apartments and our builders are not building as many single family homes. And, and for us in the industry, that, that, that's disturbing because we care about our communities. So like, 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 you know, look at that. I mean, we have to understand that home ownership changes lives. It really does. So moving forward, are our values going up or down? <laughs> so property values are going to continue to go up. So should you wait to buy? No. All right. Um, does a fixed rate mortgage fight inflation? Yes. Look, look, if you have an adjustable rate mortgage or if you're in an apartment, what happens if you're in an apartment? What happens to your rents next year? Are they going to go up? How about the year after that? Year after that? All right. How about if you have a mortgage? Fixed. I mean, your property taxes may go up, but that's, that's, that's the only thing that, that's going to that's get moving in there. You know, homeownership strengthens our communities. That's a really big deal. Uh, now, for our, a lot of our folks right now, it is going to be short-term pain, long-term gain. I, I, I know that. But one of the things I'm really looking at is, is, is we're seeing where on the brokerage level, the number of FHA uh, offers that are being accepted is, is drastically increased. I mean, for the last year, we've been here. No one wants FHA. No one wants VA. FHA and VR are both, and we're, we're both seeing that. We've got several, we have several contracts right now with with um down dpa down payment assistance included in like isn't that great to kind of see that we're moving back to more to a more balanced market so you know getting into the whole marry the house date the rates i'm a big big fan of that because i think that's that, that, that's really a good way to be kind of thing um you know the other thing is anybody anybody in here try renting a house lately First plus last plus security deposit plus pet deposit, and then you still got to put all the same other things down. What what's the average first time buyer uh, down payment? Seven percent. Now the average second time buyer is twenty two percent, but the average first time buyer is only seven percent. By the time you add all that up, are they are they pretty close to seven percent in a lot of cases? They are. Yeah. So the other thing is, you know, we're also seeing where inventory, total inventory is slightly increasing. New, in, new inventory is not, but isn't it nice seeing us move into to where inventory is slightly increasing? We also have, you know, uh, a more, we're moving into a more balanced market. I mean, a year ago, I mean, you know, let's just say a year ago, uh, no due diligence, no inspection periods, you know, all cash, $10,000 over asking. Is that where we're heading right now? No, we're not. So is this better for the buyers? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, one thing we always hear, and, and I think, it, I can't remember who quoted it, but, you know, the best time to buy is always five years ago. Seriously, like, 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 like can you think of any time in your life when five years previous, like, like oh, I wish I'd done this five years earlier. Home ownership, it's always, I wish I'd done this. I mean, who, who doesn't wish that they bought a house five years ago with what's happened with the market, right? Everybody. I wish I bought more houses five years ago. That kind of stuff. So the whole thing is, is that either either you're gonna you're gonna miss the opportunity to build that equity and that growth for you for your house and your household, or you're not. And so this is a really big deal that we want to be communicating with our folks about. So because overall, the good news here is that home ownership, you know, this is the home ownership rate for the U.S. right now. It's running at about sixty five percent. At its highest, it's been right at 69% is really kind of the highest it's been. But, but you guys see a positive or a negative trend on home ownership? It's been increasing. Yeah, it's it's positive. It's actually it's like, like this is a good sign for us. You know, ever since COVID hit, like, like COVID hit, boom. Does everybody want their own space now? It's a good place for us to be, right? We've seen that that's steadily kind of increasing now. At the same time, we're seeing where new construction is down. New construction on single family homes down big time. What, what's up big time? What's the, what's the orange? Multifamily apartments, right? So we said earlier that 
home uh, the, the wealth is tied up in home ownership. So if I own an apartment complex, who's getting the wealth? Yeah, yeah, I, I am. So, you know, like, like that, that's that whole thing about where it comes down to really educating our folks on, like, like you know, you're going to, not only are you going to be paying for this person's mortgage, you're going to be paying them profit and wealth over a long term. You're paying off their mortgage and you're making them money. Wouldn't that be good for you to capture that? Like, it, it's an important step for a lot of our buyers right now. And, and the reason I'm talking a lot about first-time buyers is right now we have a ton of pent-up demand in first-time buyers. And they're our least educated segment in the market right now. They don't know that much about home ownership. Everyone wants to buy a home, but they don't know that much about it. We need to be their advocates. At, we should be closer to 40% of our, of our buyers should be first-time buyers. And we're at 30% right now. That's a huge opportunity of pent-up demand. So you know, this is our median sales price. We've actually seen our median sales price start tapering off. Now, when 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 uh, when people talk about like like is the mark is, is the real estate market crashing? As a consumer, as a homeowner, what do you think that they think real estate crashing means? Is my house worth less? Did I lose money on my investment? Right. So now you know you can see what's kind of happened from 2012 all the way back up. And so like, like you can see where, where we've been and, and kind of where we're going. Uh, prices are gonna are gonna start leveling off. We're gonna start seeing where that line start starts kind of going even with last year. Now it's always gonna look like this kind of moving forward, but is that a bad thing for us to start leveling off of prices? No, we need that, right? No one, no one continues to you know to be you know, like like we've been running. Even last month, we, we, we ran 10% property value increase year over year. But now that's down from the 16% and the 18% and that kind of stuff. It, it, you know, our market's kind of moving like a turd of turf. So we're kind of getting there. It's just taking us a little bit. So, but one of the big issues we have for residential real estate is it all comes down to supply and demand. So our builders, we already know, aren't building enough. We have a shortage of around four and a half million homes in the U.S. also right now. So what's happening with our new listings? I don't know if you can tell, but new listings are at about 10,000. This is for, by the way, I pulled this data yesterday. So this is really, really fresh data. And so right now we're sitting on about 10,000 listings uh, in, in all of FMLS at the moment. Normally this time of year for the last Oh, last three years, we've had around 12,000 listings. So we're down about 20% in just in new listings total. Now, at the same time, who's the largest population group we have in the United States right now? Millennials. Millennials took over boomers as the largest population group. And over the next four years, the largest population group that we have in the United States is all aged 28 to 32 years old. Single largest segment of how of, of, of our uh, of Americans. Now, why do you think 28 to 32 is a very important number for us in real estate? Y'all know what age the average first-time home buyer is? 33 years old. So we have a deficit of about four and a half million houses. Our builders aren't building enough. And we have the largest population group reaching first-time home buyer age over the next four years. Now, supply versus demand. We don't have enough. We don't have enough supply. We have a lot of demand already, and we have increasing demand coming up over the next four years. Can you, with confidence, tell your buyer that you don't see property values declining? Because I don't see. Pro I, I can see property values leveling off. I see interest rates cooling things down. I see that happening. What I don't see, and, and what we're not looking at, is this 2008 crash. That's not what we're seeing happen. The market forces are very, very different from what we had back then. So, you know, and, and even if the market does go into, you know, let's, let's say the economy does go into recession. Does, what, what drives housing? Supply versus demand. Even if we go into recession, we still have not enough supply and a lot of demand, and a lot more growing demand. 
because I, you know, like, like I, I don't ever want to talk to clients and be, and feel like I'm convincing them or manipulating them. That's not what this is about. But you know, like, 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 if, if I if I really care about you and I don't help you get into a home right now, and you and you're not educated, and I don't educate you about what's really going on, and you miss that opportunity for home ownership, and you continue to pay that that landlord's rent for them and grow wealth, am I really helping you out? Do I really care about you? And so that, that, that's a big thing. The other thing that we got to look at here. So this is our new listings priced over $400,000. What do you see about that? Well, it's going down from where it was. That's true. But total, but, but look at where we are now versus look at all these other peaks here. What do you see about inventory over $400,000? It's high. It's higher. How about on homes 250,000 to 400,000? What are we seeing? So we're, we're seeing we're seeing we're seeing basically what we're seeing here is is something closer to more to moving to where the buyers are going to have a lot more power. And, and and overall these are just general numbers here. I, I know every market's very different, you know. If, if we're talking Griffin or we're talking Alpharetta, these are completely separate markets. These are just general, general numbers that we're talking about. So what we're seeing is, is that I'm kind of looking at, at, at conditions for over 400, four to 500,000 being closer to a buyer's market. This is based on supply versus demand. Anything from that 250 to 400 looks to be pretty flat as far as the total number of new listings coming on. How about Anything at two hundred fifty thousand dollars. This is anything from one hundred fifty to two fifty. Now we just said who's the largest buying segment we have in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and what's their price point? Two fifty. Our average millennial medium price point on new homes is two hundred fifty thousand dollars. What's happening in the two hundred fifty thousand dollar segment? No inventory. No inventory. So, you know, I, I, I point this out for a couple of reasons. One, how competitive is the market going to be in the $500,000 range? Not very. Nah, I mean, it, 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 it's not, it, I mean, it's, it's not a, it's not a complete buyer's market, but, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot more leveling off there. What kind of market are we seeing in, in the $250,000 price point? Who holds all the cards at 250 and under? The sellers did, right? So we gotta understand that because even though I say, look, we're heading into a more balanced market, that's overall. And so we need to make sure that, that, that we're advising our clients properly. So if I have a client who's selling a home at $500,000, do I need to be talking about, it's a seller's market, we can get what we want, we don't have to do any negotiations, we don't, you know, like, like, like we're not gonna give on anything. Is that the right message to be talking to our sellers about? But what do our sellers think? Sellers think that this is their $500,000 market, right? Now, the buyers at the same time, buyers are getting a lot more buying power at the moment. And, we, and we're glad to see that. But if you're a first time buyer buying under 250, do you have as much power as you may think you do? Because, you know, good properties in good locations in good condition under 250 are still selling crazy fast. Okay, we still have some of the shortest days on market. And, and when you look at what's the shortest days on market, what do you think it is? Houses under 250. So just understand that, that and, and what I'm trying to point out is that like, like through the past two years, we saw where our entry level tier, our mid tier and our high end properties all shot up at basically the same rates of appreciation. But now we're seeing a shift. We're seeing because of the interest rates, interest rates have moved those folks who were in that middle segment, where they moved them into. They moved them in that 250 and down segment. And our first time buyers, where are they at? 250 and down. We're, so we're seeing a, where, where there's been a whole shifting of the market, largely driven by these interest rates. And so we need to be knowledgeable about that and, and make sure that we're guiding and advising our folks properly on these kind of things. So overall, total homes for sale is up. But when you look at the number of total homes, like, like these are homes that are sitting on the market longer. 
new listings are down significantly. We're, we're down about 20% from, uh, on new listings from last year, which was down from the year before. What we are seeing is listings that are on the market that have been overpriced. Uh, a lot of sellers thinking, well, you know, let's just give it a shot. Put it out there at this price. And so we're seeing where total inventory is up a little bit. But, you know, when, when you really look at it, like, like look back here when, you know, like, like 2015, 2017, 2015 was a really good year for a lot of us, right? 31, 32,000 listings. We have 19,000 listings right now. So our total listings are, to, uh, even though we're seeing an up, uptick in, in inventory, we're, we're nowhere near where we were in 2017, and we got a lot more buyers in the market. So, you know, you know, again, understand that, that the market's moving, but it's not this drastic thing. And so we are glad to see inventory rise, but it, it's not like this has been this massive uptick of inventory. Pending sales, you can kind of see pending sales, and pending sales are down. But what do you know? I mean, what do you notice about pending sales? We talked about in the very beginning. It's seasonal. So we are down more. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying we're not down, but we are down. But a lot of this is very much seasonal things as well. Close sales, same kind of thing that we're seeing on there. However, you know, what's going on with days on market? Are days on market trending up? Yes, we're all the way up to 14 days. Yeah, that was a joke, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was really like, 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 see, like, like, and so we're seeing where, Again, good price properties in good areas are, are still moving quickly. So, you know, you know, uh, Ming has said it for years, and I love stealing this line. If you're going to sleep on it, you ain't, I mean, you ain't going to sleep in it, right? So, like, like, like if, if you're priced under 250 we still got to be having our wheels on if we're representing buyers. We do. It's going to be very competitive. It, those are still really fast-moving properties. How about supply of homes for sale? We are currently sitting at 2.3 months of standing inventory. 2.3 months. And that's with that, that's that's based on the number of sales that we have happening right now. How many months of inventory do we need in order for in order for us to have a balanced market? <laughs> Say again? Six. We need six. six months. So basically, we're a little bit over a third of the way to a balanced market. I don't need to talk about being a buyer's market. We're a third of the way to a balanced market. We need six months of standing inventory to be a market where the number of buyers and sellers match. So even though like, like, like things are looking better for buyer, uh, we still see a slight uptick in inventory kind of thing. It's not all looking doom and gloom by any means either, right? It's not looking doom and gloom for our sellers, none of that. How about our median percent of last list price? What's our, what's our, what are we averaging right now? 100%. We are currently averaging 100% of list price. So if you are representing, and now we talked about that, that 100% is going to be, that's an overall average. I am seeing where properties that sit on the market for a long time are taking price reduction. How about those homes under 200,000 that are, that are a hot commodity? What are we seeing those do? Overpriced, oh, over list price. And so, but still, as of, I mean, this is as of yesterday, we're still averaging 100% of list price right now. And that's an important number to be able to talk to your buyers about because a lot of them are like, hey, can we offer 10,000 less? Can we offer $20,000 less? If you don't want the house, yeah, we can. Right? I mean, like, like, I mean, we, I mean I, I'm, I'm all about being straight up and, and honest with them. I, I, don't want, I don't want them spending a penny more than they have to. So how about our median showings in order for a property to go to pending? We're at 10, which by the way, is still higher than our average has been for, well, since 2016, you can kind of see. I mean, it's all the way back to pre-pandemic levels is really where we're going. So we're still averaging 10 showings per property that goes under, under contract. And so that, that should be kind of a reference point for you. That's kind of the average that we're seeing out there uh, in the entire marketplace. Let's talk about a couple of things happening right now with buyers. And so one of the biggies out here is that uh, Atlanta is the fourth largest city or the, or I'm sorry, the, the big large metropolitan area with, with the fourth biggest percentage of folks that work from home. 
How's that going to impact real estate? Well, for us, you know, like, 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 first of all, we don't have any natural borders, right? So we already will drive anywhere, right? Like, like we are the epitome of sprawl to begin with kind of thing. And so when you look at, and so this is from the National Association of Realtors as far as like, where are the homes that folks are buying right now? And you can see that overall, the biggest area right now is suburban. But look what's happened to small towns. Small towns running 20%. And um, rural areas is running another 12%. So uh, two places that, that we're not seeing where the cities are, are, are rising. Matter of fact, we're seeing where, where the cities are, are dropping off a little bit. Because if you can... Uh, if you can, if you can work remotely, and you don't care where you where you live. I mean, you have a lot of different options, right? And so we're seeing where folks are are, are really like like the suburbs, the small towns, uh, moving out out into out into the rural country. As so long as they've got high speed internet, that's what they need, and that's that's one of the really bigger deals. And one thing that we have seen significantly is the second home market has basically dried up. Like even getting lending for, for second homes right now is a little bit of a challenge. I'm sure you can do it return. But I'm just saying that, that you know, um, but that second home market, so mountain properties, lake properties, that kind of stuff, we're seeing where that set, those second home markets, the amount of inventory there has drastically been rising ever since summer. So we're seeing, not, not that those were necessarily bargain areas to begin with, but I'm just saying that that second home market really, you know, with the rising interest rates, that kind of stuff, the second home market is really, really dried up on that side of things. So there is a lot more inventory in those second home markets out, out there. And so, but with so many people moving out of town, what does that show that there's some opportunity at? ITP, right? There's some opportunities inside the perimeter on that because we're seeing where there's less demand inside the city. We're also seeing where a lot more folks are very open to condos, townhomes. Like, what are our builders building right now? We're seeing a lot of builders building townhomes and condos. I mean, like, like over in Henry County, there's 750 townhomes being built right now. Yeah. <laughs> It's all of those things. What yeah, we have little small houses, mini houses. No, there are a bunch of condos oh. in off of there, off of people. Yep. Going into the street. But but we're, we're we're seeing where 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 you know that that live work play. We're seeing where where condos and townhomes and and for a lot of us, especially if you've been in the market for a long time, if, if you were here in two thousand eight, what are your feelings about townhomes? Ew, right? Because we had this huge glut of townhomes, and then. And then when the market crashed last time, everyone got this really sour taste on their in their mouth about townhomes. But for our first time buyers, what is a great starter home? There are, there's no three two ranches for our for our, our, our first time buyers. So where are they where are they gravitating for? Townhomes and condos. Yep. All right, for our sellers kind of thing, we got to start looking at, at. It's time to start looking at why would our sellers move, right? Because you know. And, and we're moving back into the into the range of, of, of just normal everyday business kind of thing. So a lot of people are moving, life changes, family, marriage, children, uh, job change, moving up or down in, in size of houses, depending on what they are. But what I really want you to see is a couple of different things. One is vast, you know, for the vast majority of sellers, they're married, married and couple, right? Couples and married. Uh, are are the biggest segment of our sellers. In addition to that, 70% of all sellers have zero kids at home. Okay? Like, like a little light bulb should go off and like, ding, 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 right? When there's no kids at home, what are people a lot more likely to do? Sell, right? I mean, we can see where, where, where you know, 69% of our sellers have zero kids. And so that's, the, you know, that, that's one of those tells. For those of you that play poker kind of thing, that's a really good thing to key in on is when folks are doing that. Uh, and then, you know, how many of our sellers are first-time sellers versus repeat sellers? A third of our sellers have never sold a home before. So I don't care. And, and for those who have sold homes before, is this market different than any other market we've been in for a long time or ever? So what do we have to make sure that we're spending a lot of time with our sellers talking about? Education, 
We need to be educating, whether they're a first time seller or a repeat seller. Because even if you sold 10 years ago, it's nothing like that now. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're going over that with them. The other, one of the challenges that we have with our sellers is do our sellers have a big urgency to sell? No. That, that's, that's becoming a big factor for us. Now, we don't have a lot, of, a lot of sellers that have a ton of urgency to sell. And so we're kind of seeing a seller strike to a certain point, right? Uh, because they're not desperate to sell. And if you're not desperate to sell, are you okay being where you're at? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of folks are unwilling to give up gains, maybe for property values kind of thing. Some folks are sitting on amazingly low fixed rates. Right now, 92% of mortgages have, have a mortgage less than 5%. And 40% of those mortgages are let under three and a half. A lot of folks refi, a lot of folks got really great mortgages. It's tough to say, let me go get a 6% house when I'm sitting on a 5% on a mortgage right now. So you know, we also see, oh, 2%, yeah. Uh, and so a lot of our sellers feel like they've missed their opportunity to sell. I mean, are we moving into a more balanced market? Yes, but, but we just looked at those numbers. You know, Is this still a good time for our sellers to sell? Yes, and if they capture that equity already and move into that dream home of theirs, is that still, I mean, are they, have they already captured that equity? I mean, everybody in the world wants to buy low, sell high. Well, I'm sorry, you've already doing the whole thing where you're like, like, like you bought low and now you're selling high. Like, 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 and everyone wants to time the market. How many people can time the market? Nobody. Okay. Nobody. So, so like, like this whole this idea of like, 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 we, what, what we see is we see sellers are missing out on opportunities for homes that they really do want and for being able to upgrade, downsize, that kind of stuff because they, they don't, you know, they're not thinking realistic. Like if you've already gathered, gathered 40, 50% of equity over the last three, three or four years, like you're, you're carrying that equity forward. Everybody, you know, everybody thinks they can buy low and sell high, but that's not the reality of it at all. But for us, one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in attracting sellers is where they're going to go. Now, the positive side of that is what's happening to inventory. Inventory is moving up, right? It's still it's still a good market. Property values, like our sellers, are not seeing property values decline. If they buy again, our property values looking like they're going to drop either. Like we need to be explaining these same things to our sellers that we just kind of went through and looked at. You know. Also for our sellers, we need to be looking at what's happening in the tornado market. Okay, you know what happens in a tornado? I mean, everybody had, like, like in my neighborhood, we had a tornado come down and it crushed like four houses and uh, my house didn't get nothing. It didn't do a single thing. It dropped trees all over like four or five houses, like all but blew them away. And so when, when you know, as a listing agent, we're seeing where this tornado market is really affecting values and homes uh what we're seeing happen is, is like there'll be three houses that come out on the market and one goes bonkers and then the other two sit on the market why and well well you know the jones is sold for two i mean the jones is sold for 350 we want 350 right but look it, it comes down to a lot of the very big basics yes last summer we saw where a lot of buyers like they would buy anything. Like needs repairs, no problem, I'll do it. Needs carpet, I'm glad to do it. Uh, needs paint, no worries. How about our buyers right now? It's coming down to price and condition. Price and condition matter. You can have three houses in the exact same neighborhood, but this one here is done up like the Taj Mahal. These other two have four micro countertops and you know the, the floors look rough and the yard's not well maintained that affects value. We're going back to a more balanced market that makes a lot more sense. And so we need to be explaining this, especially with our sellers, because sellers look out there, they, they look at the comps in the neighborhood and they're like, well, it's in my neighborhood. I ought to be able to get 352. Well, not if we don't paint, not if we don't put granite countertops in, not if we're not gonna do this and this and this and this. We need to be ready for that because we're seeing that going on already. We're seeing where one house comes out and it just flies off the market. A couple more come on, no one wants anything to do with it. 
but we have to be clear about what about the condition. And so when we talk to our sellers about setting their values, we have to be looking at comps and we have to be looking at photo and conditions of the comps that, that we're really comparing them to because it really is going to matter for it. Now, for us, we got to be, it's time for us to get back to basics. Referrals and past clients, referrals and past clients are the number one source of where, where buyers found their agent. Oh, look, referrals and past clients is the number one source for where sellers found their agent. So what do you think that we should be working on? Referrals and past clients. Thank you very, very much. Good, good. So that being said, what are we going to do about it? It's about relationships. Okay. It comes down to educating. It's all about relationships. And now we have a tool that not all of us are using very well. We all have access to KV Core. And KV Core there is, is, I mean, the whole purpose of KV Core is to help us build relationships. See, I don't care what your lead systems are. Your lead systems are there in order to drive leads into your database. And then your database is where you go to build relationships. And so one problem that I'm seeing right now is that a lot of folks, like, like KV Core <laughs> at its core is a Ferrari. And a lot of folks are getting tied up on the bells and whistles because this thing will do all sorts of things. It will brush your teeth. It will wipe your tail. There's all kinds of things this thing can do. But we're all we're all worried about so many of these things instead of worried about what are the really important things that I need to be looking at in order to grow relationships and, and be able to interact with my clients better. And so there's six areas that I really want you to look at and, and focus on. OK. There, there's a lot more that we could talk about, but all I'm doing is confusing the daylights out of everybody. So we're going to go back to the basics is really what we're looking at. So first thing, you need to go in and edit your profile. We're not talking about rocket science here, okay? Go in, put in, make sure you put in your, your ML, both MLS IDs for both Georgia MLS and FMLS. That way all your properties show up on them. Go in and update all your social media, all your contact info. All you do to get to this section is you go in here and you click on your little name right here in the top right hand corner and hit my profile. Fill it out. Put your picture in there. Ta da! We're not talking about rocket science here. Next thing, update your website or don't. I know that sounds bizarre, but like the websites work right out of the box. So if you don't mind it looking like everybody else, that's okay too. But all you do is go into your website. So you'll go over in the web and IDX over here and then click on website settings. Once you do that, you just gotta go down and you can scroll through. You can add your testimonials if you want to. If you don't put testimonials, guess what your website doesn't have? Testimonials, thank you. You can choose a different template. You can put custom navigation if you want to have pages. You can choose how the listings are displayed. But guess what? If you don't do any of this, it's gonna work just fine. You can change the pictures that show up on your website, or you can just leave them alone. So like this whole step here is more if you want to customize that kind of stuff. Our third step is import your leads. Now, importing your leads is like one of the easiest things you can do. Either you can do it yourself, or you can just email it to KV Core and they'll do it for you. Please let them do it for you. It takes them a couple of days, but my goodness, we're not talking about rock. I mean, like, like again, this is as basic as it gets. Send them the list and they put them in your database for you. Our fourth step is to understand how the smart CRM works. So when you come in here, you're gonna click on smart CRM and that's gonna list a list of all of your contacts. You need to understand how the contact record works. But then here, this is where it gives you the information about the contact, any kind of insights it has is all down through here. This whole middle section shows everything that's happened already with a client and anything that's scheduled to happen for that client. In addition to that, we have this client journey up here. We're going to talk more about the client journey in a minute, but all, everybody comes in as a new lead in the client journey. And then if they interact with any of our marketing, it automatically moves them into active leads. All right, now, but you can, if I wanted to move somebody into Sphere, all I do is click Sphere and da -da, they're moved into Sphere. So from here, if I wanted to, I could add a note, I could send them an email, I could send them a bomb bomb video, I could leave a voicemail, or I could come down here and I could do property links. 
if there's one thing that your folks want from you, it's property limits. And it's crazy easy to do. As long as you put in both your MLS and FMLS accounts in there, you go in and you set up property alerts for every one of your clients. And I recommend that you send it out twice a week, like Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday kind of thing. And, and, and then you send those alerts out. When, when, what, what do you think happens? On, what do you think pops up on your dashboard when you send out property alerts to everybody in your database and they start opening up? Hey, Bob opened this property alert. Hey, Bob looked at this one. Hey, Sue did this over here. This is your tell. This tells you who is interacting with the marketing that you're sending out. Now, the next step is smart campaigns. Now, your smart campaigns are tied to your client journey. This client journey I showed you a minute ago, depending on where you put these in. So if you've imported these folks into Sphere or Prospect, New Lead, Active, that kind of stuff, that's where the smart campaigns kick in. But they're all tied to your client journey. Because when you go in and you'll go under marketing and then go under my campaigns, you see all these campaigns are automatically turned on. If you don't want one turned on, hit the button, it's turned off. You can go in there and you can edit any single one of them. But you know, one thing that, that is not built in, so this, the system will automatically start engaging with anybody that's a new. So anybody that comes in as a new leader and active lead, the system already has smart plan or smart campaigns built up for them. So if you want to change it, click on it and change it. Save it. No big deal. Now, what's what's not in there is sphere and prospect. And so if you put someone into your sphere, you have to decide. What do I want to send them out? And all of that, you can find all that on this same page. So we need to understand how smart campaigns work because we want the system to reach out for us when we're not doing it. And then the last thing is really, we want to be able to lead generate with our systems. And so uh, probably the two things I like best are landing pages as well as squeeze pages. And here's the difference. Landing pages are static. You can build them up for just about anything. They're going to go through and, and, and you can go in there. There's, a, there's all kinds of videos, that kind of stuff. But I can, I can build static landing pages and I can use them over and over again, share them out on social media and send people in to me. The other thing I can do is, is build squeeze pages, new construction under 400,000 in this county, you know, homes under 250 in, in Newton County, homes in, under 300 and so and so. And then you put that out on social media. When you do that, what happens when they click on that link? Boom, it sends them to your website, right? If they look at more than one property, they have to put in their contact information to be able to engage with you. But at the end of the day, this is your database. You know, you, you have these tools in place and a lot of us are missing out on the opportunity. These, this is here to help you build relationships. Now, I can't say that if you have a, a, a database that you will grow your business. I can say that you will not grow your business Big time without a database. Every top producer has a database. So the other thing that you want to be looking at is social media. Some of us put the most random crap on social media. And I don't know why. I'm being straight up, right? So like, like, like it's kind of like, hey, another closing, da, 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 that kind of stuff, or just, just weird random things. What I want you to look at is you have to look at who is your target client and what are their concerns. And then that's what you post about. Like be intentional. Right now, so many of us, when it comes to social media kind of thing, we just post random stuff. We stick it on the wall and see what stays. We throw it on the wall, see, see what sticks, basically. And so what I'm saying is be intentional about it. So if, if I'm trying to attract and if I want to work with first-time buyers, what are some first-time buyer concerns? Get down payment. How do I get a mortgage? You know, um, are, 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 is there any homes under $250,000? Is there this? Da, da, da. I mean, all that is a very different set of concerns than someone than sellers. Sellers have concerns too, but they're different. If I'm trying to attract first time buyers and I know these are their concerns, what do you think I should be posting about on social media? Their concerns and answers to those. Using things like, like your KV Core to share out listings under $250,000, listings over here in this, condos in Atlanta, townhomes in so and so. Things that are going to be very appealing to them rather than just, you know, another open house, da, da, da. not that there's anything terrible about that, but, but like, let's be intentional about what we're doing. 
Let's have a plan for it. And let's, let's try and grow our business in the ways that we want to grow our business. Because this can be very, very effective for us when done properly. So decide who, do you, who is it that you want to work with, then set those, those things up in your social media rather than just like, like you know, out here getting it. Like, I, just don't, I mean, I, I, I see it. I just saw a post by the agent out here getting it. Like, ooh, let me work with them. They're getting it. I don't know what that, you know, like, like, like that, that doesn't do anything for them. Speak to me. Speak to me. What, speak to my concerns. And that's where people are going to interact with you on, on social media and that stuff. Um, I want to wrap with this. And that is rich habits versus poor habits. Because there are a difference. So we had an author, he went out and he, and he auditioned 250 millionaires. And he said, what are the six traits, six attributes? What are the, what are the habits of the, of the, and these are self-made millionaires. We're not talking about people that like, this ain't daddy's money kind of thing. These are folks that built it from them, from, you know, built it for themselves. So uh, first one is that self-made millionaires are constantly learning. So the fact that you're here today is a big, big deal. But I want you to see some things in here. 49% take a few minutes every day to learn new words. 61% shared what they practice a new skill uh, for a minimum of two hours a day. How many of you practice real estate two hours a day? Practice on learning your, your trade. 63% listen to audiobooks on their way to the, to the commute. Uh, like, like. A lot, of the, a, lot, a lot of your top CEOs and that kind of stuff, a lot of self-made millionaires are working on their development for two hours a day. And we can't come into a three-hour CE class once a month kind of thing. I mean, like, seriously, like, like, like we need to be serious about, about are we trying to build wealth for ourselves? You know, self-made millionaires listen more than they talk. They use the five-to-one ratio, all right? For every minute I speak, I need to listen for five. And that's a really good way to be kind of thing. 81% said they seek feedback every day. Feedback from other agents, coworkers, uh, branch managers, me. I'll do any of that kind of stuff. But, but seek feedback. Always be improving. Self-made millionaires build great teams. Now, I'm not talking about just as a real estate team. I'm talking about you are a small business person. Who all needs to be on your team? That was that was not rhetorical. Like like, who should be on your team? So you need you need a great lender, right? You need you need you need a knowledgeable closing attorney who can help you answer those kind of questions. Home inspectors, home warranties, yeah, uh, pray. I mean, you need all that list of folks. The other thing in here it says for the you know for a lot of your self made millionaires, if they don't possess a particular skill, they delegate to someone who is great at it. Because I've seen some of y'all's paperwork. Y'all shouldn't be doing paperwork. Sorry. Some of y'all need, need a transaction coordinator. So, uh, some of y'all need an assistant. Uh, and, and so we got to be looking at that. Uh, Self-made millionaires dream big. I'll, I'll talk to folks and be like, hey, we, we, you know, what's going on with your business? I, I'm just trying to sell a house a month. Ugh. Sorry, I'm going to be looking down at anybody. But like, 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 seriously, like, 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 like dream big. Like, like uh, a lot of times we're afraid to dream big because if we dream big and we don't achieve it, then, then somehow that affects our self-worth, right? So I'm going to challenge you to dream big, push yourself, grow your business kind of thing. Uh, Self-made millionaires prioritize their health. I know the fat guy standing in front talking about prioritizing health. I am down about 50 pounds right now, but seriously, like, like taking your health into, into account, like, like you can't work on your business if you don't work on you. Because if you're not here to enjoy it, it's not going to do you any kind of good. Uh, and then self-made millionaires make their own luck. Now I'm not talking about Vegas, right? I'm talking about hard work, right? Diligence, staying at it. You know, um, you know, we're we're going through a shifting market. Is that is that a great reason for some people to quit? Well, for some people, like some folks are just looking for the reason why they couldn't do it. But like, like you know. There's a lot of opportunity in our industry. There's a lot of opportunity to be millionaires in our business. And, and I know a lot of them, and I'm blessed to know them kind of thing. But it, it, you know, it comes through persistence and really, really you know, being continual to, to push yourself, push your business, and drive it forward. So um, thank you guys.
sorry if I ran a little bit long there. I kind of got long winded and I didn't mean to um, on that. So I do want to go out and congratulate our top performers. And um, uh, and then at this point, I'm gonna, uh, you know, the branch managers in all locations, they're going to they're going to jump up here and then our lenders. So thank you, guys. And if anybody wants the slides, just ask the branch managers. I'll send it over to them. <laughs>